Thank you. I'm delighted to participate in this event. Um, I'm enjoying the presentations um, and I commend um, your organization. Um, as mentioned, I am a human rights advocate and educator. And therefore, um, in, in telling you about the history, I'm not going to be looking to, to frame um, the Universal Declaration, both in terms of its development, the importance of its development, but also how we can and should understand it as advocates for human rights. And given your organizational orientation, that is, I think, what you are doing and, and one of the reasons you're asking me to, to do this. And in thinking about this, um, I always look back to the quote from Martin Luther King, which he gave in response to the question of how he could um, maintain himself as an advocate in the face of conflict and the struggles that he was facing. And his, his quote basically says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so when we look at, at human rights, I think using that, that quote is very helpful to understanding its importance and, and how we develop. In terms of the historical development of human, at, at, looking at the arc of the moral universe or looking at the arc of human rights, it is a long process. Um, there are a lot of, of scholars that do try to trace back human rights and link it to earlier historic periods of developments. Uh, this is particularly common for people of faith, where they try to understand and ground their understanding of human rights in terms of the religious traditions they're coming from and the literature that they're going from. Um, and that's important and it's valuable. However, in terms of the Universal Declaration itself, I find that the, the, the easiest starting point is, is to start from the late 1700s, because that's the point where rights as we currently understand them began to emerge in full flower. Um, so at, at the late 1700s, um, latter half of the 1700s, you see the universal, you see the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, which are explicitly setting out what we now refer to as civil and political rights, the right to free speech, the right of assembly, the right to of the accused, and so forth. This was also reflected in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Um, very clear statements, but very regionalized and very specific. Early 1800s, we see the emergence of the abolition movement against chattel slavery, which was an international movement, which was very important. Um, it was not a, a movement that in, developed within a single country, but one that grew from a collaboration. Late 1800s, early 1900s, we see the labor movement, the emergence of socialism and communism, and the emergence of what we now recognize as social and economic rights, the rights of the workers to organize, the rights to a decent wage, the rights of health care and so forth, came through there. All of those rights were important. All of those rights we can look now and kind of see what they were, but they were disparate and they were very state-centered. World War II changed all of them. As was mentioned in the, in the initial overview, the tragedy and the shock of World War II and the Holocaust and the consequences of it was so great that it brought the world together and, and formed uh, an impetus to kind of confront the causes of that and the signals of that. And one of the things that, that it did is, is both in the, the formation of the UN and in the UN Charter, in the preamble of the UN Charter and in the Universal Declaration, the international community recognized that human rights was something that the international community needed to deal with. And effectively what happened is that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, ascent, essentially achieved four things um, with human rights. The first thing it did was that it internationalized human rights. Historically, we operate from what is known as the Westphalian system. 
um, coming out of the Treaty of Westphalia to resolve the Thirty Years' War, in which sovereignty is on, where the relationship between the state and its citizens is exclusively a concern of that country. And as a result of the war, as a result of seeing the atrocities that were committed by the Nazi regime, and recognizing that how Germany treated its own citizens both represented the sickness of the Nazi system and also represented the threat to international peace and stability, the international community came together and said, no, uh, human rights is not simply a matter of domestic concern. It is a concern to everybody. And, it and in the preamble for the Universal Declaration, it specifically recognizes that recognition of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. UN Charter has a similar statement about the importance of maintaining human rights. So instead of thinking of human rights as a domestic concern, UN, the UDHR reflects a transition saying, no, it is an international concern and all states can and should be dealing with. The second thing is that the UDHR helped define what human rights are. There were in the, in the UN Charter, it says we will protect human rights, but it doesn't say what those rights are. And the Universal Declaration says that and says, okay, let's concretely bring them together and define what we mean when we're saying protect human rights. Because there were, there were different emphases and different approaches from different countries as to what they focused on. The third achievement of the Universal Declaration is, is that it, uni it unified different rights. As it suggested, in the, in the emergence of rights, we saw civil and political rights emerge first in the 1700s in the West. And we saw the economic, social, and cultural rights emerging with the labor movement and with in the socialist and communist environment. And essentially what happened is, is for, for some time, there was a, a dichotomy. There were forces that argued that civil and political rights were the most important. Others argued that economic and cultural rights were the most important. The Universal Declaration combined them said they're all important and they're all important together. And what is even more important, the first fourth thing that the UDHR did was that it stated that they all have equal rights. Now this this was this was a controversial move. It was a controversial position and it was not necessarily well received worldwide. During the Cold War, what we found is, is that in the West there was a focus and an emphasis on civil and political rights. Whereas in the East, under the Iron Curtain, there was a focus on, the, on this, the cultural and economic rights. And they used those as weapons to criticize each other. And one of the challenges has been is post Universal Declaration is to find ways to make sure that people recognize that they are not separate, that they cannot be weighted, but they are in fact equal and all of them need to be addressed. Now, as I said, in thinking of this history, um, I use the quotes of the arc of history. And the arc of history is important here in, in uh, understanding the broad approach and what, what the Human Rights Project is about. And in that sense, I think the quote reveals the nature of the human rights in some ways, and it masks the project in others. It reveals the nature of human rights project first in that it says that it is an arc and it points in a direction, but it remains incomplete. So that while we can look at the Universal Declaration of it, of it human rights as being important, it was incomplete. And it needed it, a continuing process of work to bring it to completion. 
as was mentioned in the, in the first presentation about the, the declaration, um, the Universal Declaration, when it was promulgated, was not promulgated as law. It was promulgated in a declaration of the UN, not in a multilateral treaty that would have made it. What has happened subsequent to that is, is that advocates have throughout the world advocated for and helped promulgate treaties and conventions that would articulate and translate that into concrete international law. They've also worked to translate in, that into domestic law. So it is a long-term process that is ongoing. And the Universal De Declaration and the formation of the UN really reflects a, reflect of a, a deflection point in history, something that fundamentally changed the direction of human rights, but is still within that tradition. The second thing is that the goal of human rights is justice. Uh, it is not the specific rights that are articulated in, in the International Universal Declaration. It is those reflect our understandings of what it means to achieve justice. And so as advocates, it's important to always bear in mind, our goal is justice, not the simple implementation of any particular right, whether it's in the Universal Declaration or if it's in one of the multilateral conventions. What the quote masks um, is that an arc suggests that it's a smooth line, that that we can look and and in, in my summary in some ways it looks that way because i said we saw the emergence of, of of civil and political rights in the 1700s and you can see progressive improvements and expanding understanding of human rights and in the long term that is is useful uh view because as advocates you want to have hope for the future but in reality, in the day-to-day -day work of advocacy, what you also find is, is that you're making two steps forward and one step back, or three steps forward and two steps back. It is not an easy process. And so change happens slowly and it takes time to revisit. For example, if we look at if we look at women's rights, women's rights, you saw in the 1800s, you saw the first outpouring of women's rights, the first women's movement, which was fo focused on getting women basic rights, the right to, to vote, the right to own property, the right to sign a contract, things that would just simply treat them as people. As that was accomplished, the movement what waned and, and lost force. And essentially, you had to have a second wave of feminism, which happened in the 50s and 60s where feminists started saying, well, wait a minute, it's, it's not enough that we simply have the law in place. We also have to make sure that they treat women equally. They have to respect women as though they were men and give them the same rights that they were men and not protect them as a, as a vulnerable class. And then that movement progressed for a while and then it had reverses it had there there you know there was a backlash against feminism and it came up to require a third wave of feminism which basically came in and said well it's not enough that you give me a law that treats me exactly like a man the reality is i'm a woman i have different needs and different responsibilities such as bearing children and therefore what you want is you want equality but you also want to make sure that the systems are not inherently biased so that the definition of an effective worker is somebody who can work like a traditional male with no responsibilities for the home because the home is carried out by the woman. You need to make systemic changes. So it took, it took three waves of development to advance that. And within that, there was, you know, there was, improvements and then there was failures. And the second thing that that, that the quote masks is is that it 
it states that, that the art bends towards justice. It sounds like that's predetermination. The reality is, is it requires somebody to push to make sure that the art bends in the right way. And so therefore, in looking at, um, at looking at the development of history, your role as advocates is critically important. And therefore, I don't like to think of, of human rights as a body of law or a series of treaties or something like that. I look at human rights as the human rights project. It is a project of we, the people, working together and aspiring and pushing to improve what we've developed to date and what needs to be addressed in the future. So within that Universal Declaration, I think is an important inflection point, but it's one that simply laid the groundwork and helped work for where we are now and where we are going forward. Thank you.